you know, I've always been uh, previously invited by the Mahdi Institute, and I'm sorry that I disappointed you at that time. I, I couldn't participate. It's a real honor. It's important for us to keep this conversation going. And I'm really honored to be with Dr. Nubaha today on, on this platform, but also good to know my good friend, uh, Professor um, Mohsen Kadivar is also on the call, as are several, several other people. So uh, since this is the format of a format of a workshop, I'm going to kind of share some ideas. Uh, they might not all be finished, and hopefully um, when the paper uh, is asked for, we can have some more finished products. But so I want to have a set of provocations and, and thank you uh, for, to the organizers for, for doing this. Um, first, first of all, I want to argue that this question of, um, you know, I'm using Ghazali. Ghazali is far from a perfect figure uh, in Islamic history. Even though Ghazali has been severely critical of the Ismailis that he dis, you know, deemed to be uh, the most dangerous people, he was also critical of some Imami Shias. Nevertheless, somehow the Shias love him. Um, and, you know, um, Fayez Kashani wrote, uh, you know, Al Mahajat al Bayda, which he, uh, you know, um, rewrites uh, Ihya Ulum al Din, uh, that's more, you know, um, in line with uh, certain kind of uh, Shi sensibilities. And so I don't think Ghazali is perfect, but I do believe the Ghazali begins a conversation of opening the possibility of toleration and pluralism within the Muslim tradition. He might also not be the only one. Uh, and there might have been others, you know, normally as uh, one, one talks about those things that you know, so I know Ghazali, and I'm thinking through Ghazali as to what kind of possibilities Ghazali give us. Um, so whether Ghazali's insights that I will soon share whether this leads to freedom, especially freedom of a, of a modern kind, that is a very moot point. And we can argue over that, but it's not my goal to translate Ghazali as an advocate of modern freedom. And the second part is that my goal is not to find modern freedoms in the ancient tradition. But what I am trying is to attempt a conception of history, especially of Muslim kalam and fiqh, roughly translated as theology and applied jurisprudence, that is fiqh and, and ilmul kalam, as well as the underlying you know, usul of both kalam and fiqh, which is moral philosophy. So I'm trying to do a conception of history that is called genealogy, and I cannot elaborate right now, but genealogy is drawing on Foucault and Nietzsche. So what I mean by that is genealogy is not looking at the idea from origins to somewhere else. It, the word, the way Nietzsche uses it is very counterintuitive. Genealogy is not a sequential idea in the Nietzschean and Foucaultian uh, concept, conception. Genealogy is a form of critique where one delegitimizes the present or makes the present strange by separating it from the past to show how new our, our position is, how new freedom of speech is, how new this idea is that we have in order to gain some perspective rather than two kinds of triumphalism this false triumphalism of the present, that the present is the best time that there ever was, or the triumphalism that tradition already had all the answers before. These are the kind of false triumphalism that we find in these debates. So the question is, I wish to provide a genealogy of thought, in other words, a snapshot of the history of thought within tradition. And I'm only going to pick on a few points of Ghazali. It also means the need to treat the tradition that is the Torah, and the Torah is very complex, and there are different ways that Muslims access the tradition, varieties of methodologies, but to treat the tradition as variegated and not as a cookie cutter and one size fits all. It also implies the need to be patient in order to unravel the possibilities of tradition. 
instead of rushing for what I call the fast food version of Islamic freedom, you know, the McDonald's version of Islamic freedom. You know, we can just go and take it off the shelf. Well, you know, someone, someone wrote about it and ah, we have freedom. No, I don't think that that is the way I would, I, I, I would argue for that. I think we need to be patient, unravel the possibilities of tradition, and then ask the question, uh, you know, whether what the past had was really freedom or what was that? So my point of departure is that the historical Muslim tradition and all interpretations therein are part of a political theological. They have all the interpretations historically because it comes from an imperial background. Besides, you know, the prophetic society in Mecca and Medina, very soon Islam became part of an imperial empires, multiple empires. And not only Islam, but also neighboring societies uh, and, and cultures and civilizations were also empires. And the empire has a particular kind of logic. <clears throat> and the political theology of empire is one of supremacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it is hierarchical. The person belonging to the uh, to closest to the essence of the empire has preference. And in the Islamic society, it was the male, um, and and then a woman, then a free, uh, then a slave, and the variety. So, and 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 yesterday, the parts of it that I that I listened in. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Takim mentioned about, you know, if you want to do uh, engage in blasphemy, do it in front of a woman, right? That is all part of a, a theology of empire because it, it embeds things in a particular way. So I think we need to keep that in mind. And that theology of empire privileges obedience. Ta, obedience is preeminent. And that framework, uh, uh, you know, is something that we need to think about when we are doing the history and when we are trying to engage with tradition in order to understand how different it is what we are doing here. So, for instance, when the governor of Egypt's son, Amr bin As, when he mistreated an Egyptian uh, and there was very little correction or reprimand on the part of Amr bin As of his son, who was the governor of Egypt, Amr bin As was famously chastised by the the Khalif in Medina, who was Omar ibn Khattab. And Omar's famous statement was, Mata nasa ya Amar ahrara. Since when have you enslaved people? In other words, since when have you treated them as the subject of, your, of the wombs of your family, O Amar? When their mothers bore them as free women. In other words, the womb out of which some people would deliver with that of free women and free women's children will be free. But slave women's children are not necessarily free. It was only subsequent ishtihad that said, you know, that the idea that the uh, Ummul Walad cannot be resold, but the Ummul Walad doesn't become free. Okay, so we need to understand these questions historically in very careful ways and not and not impose modern ideas on the past in order to extract, extract uh, the idea of freedom or anything. In other words, I'm saying the burden of the work that we need to do today is we, that we need to do our own work in understanding our own society. But the question really is, how does that break with, how is it continuous with tradition? Or how does it break with tradition? Or how does tradition change and alter? with some continuity and some discontinuity. In other words, I have seen this incident of the Amr story as if people thought that, you know, Amr had, had written, or Omar had, Omar had, oh, sorry, not Amr, Omar had written, uh, you know, the Universal Declaration of Freedom, uh, freedom of, of, of Human Rights. That is bizarre. That is not the way one does history. Uh, so, second point is interpretation. All interpretation, Professor, sorry. Not, I don't know. Yes. Oh, sorry, Professor. Um, your slides aren't moving. Um, just so you're no, no, aware, I don't know. If... No, no, I'm not moving the slide yet. 
Fine, fine, fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe uh, no, I'm not ready for that yet. So the second is all interpretation. All interpretation interpretation does never stand on its own. Interpretation. Uh, is always embedded in a larger framework of political theology. So, for instance, those of us debating freedom of expression uh, today is a direct response to the political theology of liberal democracy and its desire to distribute certain goods. Um, and there are different notions of freedom apart from liberal notions of freedom. And, and therefore, we keep that in mind. So, interpretation is always political theological. And I don't mind that people do a liberal or social or a new Islamic version of freedom, but you need to give an account. You need to give a moral theological account. And that account must be convincing. It cannot be a superimposition of drawing out ideas from the past and saying those ideas fully are transla translatable today or transplantable today, but rather work needs to be done and say, well, there is an idea. So for instance, Sarakhsi in his famous book says that, you know, uh, we have Hurma and Hurriya. And the previous speaker also meant Hurriya. Hurriya in the medieval world meant not, it possibly meant choice, that you have a choice, ikhtiar, but the rather meaning was that you are a free person, you are not a slave. and secondarily that you have certain amount of choice and that choice you deliberate the choice in the variety of ways so ghazali in his in his book um um uh, faisal al um then uh, sorry is that can you see that okay ghazali in the opening of his book faisal al tafriqa bain al islam al zandaqa that Sherman Jackson translates as on the boundaries of theological tolerance in Islam. That is obviously a more poetic translation, but literally the Ghazali's title is the decisive separation between Islam and theological subversion. Zandaka was a medieval um, uh, was a medieval way of dealing with political subversives, uh, and it has more than more than one meaning too, uh, and and uh, uh, and 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 that. That's how uh, it, it played out. So Ghazali, in the beginning of the Faisal al-Tafriqa, says, وَاسْتَحْقِرْ مَنْ لَا يُحْسَدْ وَلَا يُقْضَرْ وَاسْتَزْغِرْ مَنْ بِالْكُفْرِ وَالضَّلَالِ لَا يُعْرَفْ So Ghazali got a lot of attacks for some of his writings and criticism. And he makes, he says, despise the one who is not envied or falsely accused. Feel deprived if you don't have a reputation for peddling unbelief and misguidance. So anybody who's going to do any kind of serious work is quickly going to be accused of engaging in, in misguidance. Oh, gosh, I, I shouldn't have uh, pressed this button that, that allows for um, this uh, subtitling to come out at the bottom, my error. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't know how to change it right now. Um, nevertheless, it can be quite irritating too. Um, nevertheless, I think Ghazali, uh, yeah, you see that injurious critique, Ghazali says you might have to accept it because it's a badge of honor. Um, and, um, you know, so people are going to accuse you uh, for a lot of things. And one just hoped that Ghazali could have shown some leniency towards the Muslim philosophers following his own adage. Um, because Ghazali's critique of his various adversaries were also not free from political theological pronouncements. But what is what is what is interesting and useful is uh, you know two uh, uh, insights from Ghazali. One is that in the Qanun al-Ta'wil, he says that you know. Any interpretation must have three intersecting features. It should have been canon of interpretation, Qanun al-Tawil. He says you must, you must have humility. You don't know all the answers. You need to foster reason. And when there is more than one interpretation, you need to encourage a plurality of interpretations. 
So if I put it in a triangle like that, humility, reason, and the plurality of views, these three dimensions should be intention on a, uh, in, in his view, keep that intention. And if you keep those three dimensions intention, uh, he thinks that you can make quite a lot of headway in your interpretive uh, possibilities. And, 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 and one of the things that I think that Ghazali objected to the Muslim philosophers was that if they said, for instance, bodily resurrection is one meaning, but there could also be spiritual resurrection, if they made the plurality of that, it would have been okay. But because they were so absolute in saying that bodily resurrection is completely false and only spiritual resurrection is, that's where Ghazali showed them the red card, so to speak, the, the heretical, the theological red card, and said, no, you're out of bounds. Because Ghazali himself encountered that when he, for instance, interpreted the question of, you know, angels do not enter a house where there are dogs, and he interpreted that to mean angels do not enter a, a, a heart in which there are canine-like qualities, people objected and said, how can you give such a metaphorical interpretation? So he said, well, I do believe in a literal one, but also this is also a possibility. So the Ghazalian uh, you know, uh, interpretation is reason, humility, plur plur plurality of views. But there's another dimension in the Faisal al-Tafriqa. Ghazali begins to tell us about uh, that we need to think about existence in much more complex ways. Wujud, essential existence, sensory existence, conceptual, imaginative existence, cognitive existence, analogical existence. In other words, what Ghazali is now saying that if you interpret the revealed text if you interpret prophetic authority on one of these possible uh, um, registers of interpretation, it should be okay. So, for instance, by essential, uh, 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 you know, existence, he means, you know, what what would be, you know, a correspondence theory of 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 language. Uh, you know, there's heavens and earth, and you know. Uh, you understand things in a nominal interpretation of revealed materials uh, or things relate to the essence, so to speak. So the Quran talks about apples or the prophet talks about a garden, then it means those things in the essential terms. But then he also opens up that possibility that you can have sensory existence. So for instance, there's a hadith that says, you know, on the day of judgment, uh, death will appear in the form of a ram and then be and then be slaughtered. Now, that is so sensory, and I think in the Ghazalian interpretation, that means that in the hereafter, there will be true reality, but in this world, you need to give this true reality a certain kind of interpretation, and he then says, we, that is the real sensory existence, and that inter that statement needs to be interpreted in meaning for in that world, in a world where that will be, uh, uh, you know, possible, not in this world. He then talks about, you know, conceptual existence uh, or imaginative existence uh, involving simile and synecdoche, kinaya, and uh, he gives several examples there. He talks about cognitive existence, al-wujud al-aqli, um, and analogical existence, al-wujud al-shabahi. Now, what is, what is Ghazali's real uh, uh, in objection is that any in all interpretation must result in one not, one should, an interpretation should not result in the refutation of the messenger. It mustn't ta be tantamount to tagribur rasul. And what Ghazali does here is open up the possibilities of interpretation because the number one issue for 21st century Muslims is the question of interpretation, is how do you interpret the world and how do you interpret existence? The various pol political theologies that we are surrounded by, the various economic systems that we are surrounded by requires a way to understand the world. Gadamer did a great job for Western philosophy 
by talking about truth and method and thinking about these issues in terms of a 20th century philosopher thinking about the, the, the complexity of past and present. The similar challenge is in, in front of the modern Muslim, and that is to, in, you know, to understand our, our theology, our ethical norms, uh, and these are all incarnations of being in existence. And we are part of existence, not independent of it. So while Ghazali framed existence in five categories for his time, what made sense to him then, in my view, this is not a finite project. The bigger picture that Ghazali helps us to think about is the search for ontological truth. And building on this, we can develop a larger philosophical infrastructure and amend Ghazali's ideas and add others. So for instance, in our world, techne and technology is, a, is vital to our existence, but when we adopt technology, it is a Faustian bargain. You win some things and you lose some things. Diversity and pluralism is, uh, are both integral to our existence. In other words, one could draw on modes of thinking like that of, say, Heidegger and construe being as part of design. In John, uh, you know, uh, in other words, um, by meaning, uh, you know, being and, and existence or, or uh, as uh, and in John Hoagland's words, design is living a way of life that embodies an understanding of being. And this question of being, yes, I'm oh, about to wrap up. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, and, and and this and this, what he does is that it it is it embodies a a a certain uh, idea of being in the world. Design means being in the world, and we need to have an understanding. And this impacts human personhood, but it also impacts politics. Impacts a whole variety of of, of possibilities, and. What I would argue is that, you know, we need to think about freedom of speech. The word speech could be a synecdoche for what I would call freedom of responsibility. In other words, in the axial age that Jaspers identified, humans developed a more profound sense of interiority and conscious as we historically have mapped this. Um, and, and that Islam comes in as a tradition in this axial age uh, where it develops a civilization of obligation and duty. The move to the post-axial age, which we experience with massive transformations of technology, notions of selfhood, alterations in political economy and politics means that we now valorize the idea of freedom. But freedom is not necessarily the opportunity to make choices, but freedom is also the opportunity for responsibility. Unfortunately, um, in Western Europe and North America, freedom of speech has been weaponized against minorities, especially Muslim minorities and majority Muslim majority society at large. Freedom of responsibility means the possibility of imagining different kinds of notions of being in the world. The absolute right to insult the sanctities of others is merely one way of exercising freedom. But that is neither universal, nor is it necessarily productive in diverse societies. And so if I want to, if one were to think about what I shared in terms of practical political connotations, um, then, you know, Gadamer, who is known for his longstanding insistence on the connection between hermeneutics and praxis, in other words, theory put into practice, and developing a Ghazalian perspective on being in the world where one develops a capacity of understanding and while Ghazali framed that in terms of an internal Muslim uh, you know, conversation to open up the possibilities of toleration, one can use that as a basis to begin to think about what, you know, with people from other uh, traditions and other perspectives. In other words, how to uh, uh, pursue mutual dialogue and mutual respect. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.